Hello, my good friends. Mike Shreve here, founder and head troublemaker of the No Pants Project. You're listening to episode 10 of the No Pants Show, 17 self-care tips for freelancers. Here's something that is very important to know, to understand, and to realize. You, in a freelancing business, which I define a freelancing business as one person and maybe a virtual assistant, you as a freelancer, like you the person, your body, your mind, your emotional makeup, you are the number one and most important asset in your business. You have a moral and fiduciary responsibility as the owner of your business to care for the one asset that generates 100% of your revenue, which is you, the person. So this episode isn't about rainbows and unicorns and we're only going to do our business if we feel good because you and I both know life happens no matter what we do for a living. So there are going to be days where you're going to have to work even when you don't feel like it. But... If we can leverage the freedom that freelancing offers to develop some habits and tools and systems, we can do a better job as the business owner of taking care of the asset, which is us, that produces all of our revenue. Here's 17 ways that I found to be very helpful for myself. Take what is helpful to you, and then go find more for yourself. Number one, meditate or pray. The idea here is to get in the habit of learning how to calm your mind. More specifically, it's not like building up a muscle. That's not how meditation works, unfortunately. Instead, how I like to think of it is the more time you spend meditating, the more used to being calm you get and you retrain how your brain responds to situations. True or not true, a lot of the problems in your life or a lot of the pain that you feel or a lot of the stress and anxiety that you feel is self-caused. Much of that self-caused frustration and pain and stress comes from our reaction to an event rather than our strategic calm thinking through of a response or a plan to some new information or data that we may have received. For example, someone sends you a nasty email, you send one back because you're offended, now you have a whole new problem. That is a self-imposed moment of stress. Meditation or or significant amounts of prayer, just depending on what you decide to do. I prefer meditation. Meditation allows you in that moment when you're about to do something silly that you'll regret later, allows you to stop, take a step back, think things through, practice a calm approach, and you know nine times out of ten, you come out way better than if you had just reacted immediately to a situation. How many times in your life have you ever thought the sky was falling, taken a step back, written down on a piece of paper what's actually going on, and realized, okay, there is a way out of this? That's what meditation can bring you. Number two, raise your heart rate every 45 minutes. One of the things I am just absolutely fascinated with is the modern modern knowledge workers interaction with the digital interface. In other words, how many steps away from like the computer being built into our brain are we? <laughs> right? So, I love cyberpunk as a genre, and so I'm just absolutely fascinated with how we interact with technology and how it kind of what's the human relationship to these things that we spend an awful lot of time on, right? The phone, 
the computer. Uh, and what's the result of interacting with that? Well, one of the results of doing our work on a computer is that we tend to sit a lot, significantly more than our ancestors ever did. And our bodies are not necessarily designed, and I've seen actually research in, in a, commenting on this in a couple of different ways, but in general, research suggests that sitting for a significant amount of time is, is not just bad for you in that it, you know, increases uh, the weight that you put on, but it's actually the type of weight that you put on by sitting is a different type of weight than, let's say, a farmer might put on if they just tend to consume a lot of calories, but they're you know, they're constantly working outside. Those are two very different types of weight gain. And the the weight that you gain from sitting down all day is called visceral fat, has a significantly higher chance of leading to heart disease, cancer, diabetes, type 2, etc., and etc. So, with all that said, there's something that I find even more important when it comes to self-care and optimizing the asset, which is us, and it's blood flow and oxygen to the brain is reduced when we sit for long periods of time. So we're trying to make a living using our brain, designing, programming, writing, whatever it is that we're doing, accounting, whatever our service is for other people, and we are robbing it of the nutrients and uh, fuel that it needs to produce at its best. So what I have found, um, and this is not my own idea, which I, I wish I could track the source, but I found it, uh, uh, sort of discovered it a few years ago uh, from some movement specialist. I wish I could remember who it was. He basically suggested every 45 minutes, get up and raise your heart rate. So not... You don't need to sweat, and we're not talking about a full workout. For example, you could just do some squats. You could walk up and down some stairs. I like to go play with my kids and just do it for like three, four, five minutes. And what you're doing is you're getting the blood flowing again and you're getting the oxygen coming back into your brain. I recommend you do that every 45 minutes. Not only will you be more mentally sharp and have better mental clarity, but you will also see emotional results because a lot of our emotional response is physiological. So there's lots of studies about um, if you were to throw back your shoulders and lift your neck, you can actually feel more confident. And all you did was adjust the physiology. So you just adjusted your posture, put your neck up, raise your chin a little bit, take bigger strides, and you can actually feel, have an emotional reaction that you feel more confident. The reverse is also true. If you shrug your shoulders, look down, and kind of shuffle your feet, you can feel, you can have an emotional response based off of your physiology. So getting up every 45 minutes, you will actually find an increase in happiness, but also an increase in emotional stability, which is very, very important when running a business to not be so easily swept up in the highs and lows and then making decisions based off of how you might feel in that particular moment. Number three, plan the day the night before. Those who have ever worked with me, uh, either even on -on one-on-one coaching or in uh, as a client of mine or on my team here at No Pants, you know I don't answer emails straight away. I used to, and I used to also not get stuff done, and I used to have very reactionary days, 
and I not you know it was just it was rough. What I do now is the the day before I will sit down with a pen and paper and I'll write down I'll just whatever's in my head, all the things I think I need to get done. It's like twenty or thirty things every single time I do it. Then I pick three, and I only do those three. If answering emails is not one of those three things, I don't answer emails that day. So that is an illustration of self-care through prioritization. A lot of freelancers forget that they need to prioritize what is important to the growing of their business if they want their business to grow. If you put as your top three, send out some emails, build my lighthouse, and I don't know, spend some time in the Facebook group getting feedback on something or attend a Q&A with Mike. If those are the three things you put on your to-do list and then you get caught up in social media and all of a sudden you're on YouTube and, 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 and. What has happened is that you now are no longer taking care of yourself because you told yourself what you needed to do And the self-care move would have been to do those things because doing those things is what would have taken you to where you want to go. That's very difficult to do without writing it down. Here's what will likely happen if you start this process. Likely, you'll start the process and you'll start writing things down and you still won't be able to do them. My recommend, meaning you'll still get distracted, things will happen, you'll be reactionary. My recommendation is you keep doing it anyways, because eventually you'll just get sick of yourself. Eventually you'll be like, okay, this is silly. I keep writing these things down every single night. And the next morning I don't do any of them. Tomorrow, let me just do one. And then you'll experience what it's like to get one of those things done. And then you say, you know what, tomorrow I think I'm going to try two. And then three, it's okay to use your emotion against your other emotions. (laughs) I do it all the time, right? So this idea of I'm just going to get myself so frustrated that I stop this other emotion, which is boredom or uh, fear or something. Like, I'll just get myself so like, oh, what am I doing? I just need to do this. And it helps to overcome some other powerful emotion that that might be dictating my actions in some other way. Number four, brain dump and walk away. It is so important to keep your mind clean and clear. One of the best ways to do that is to just put everything on paper and then to just walk away from it. Don't put it on paper and then try to like solve all of life's problems. Put it on paper, walk away and let your subconscious go to work. We'll talk a little bit about walking away here in a second. Number five, get an accountability partner. Getting an accountability partner is probably the best way you can take care of yourself. It is the gift that keeps on giving because Here's the thing. You want certain things from life. Most of the things you want are very different than the reality you're living right now. What that means by definition is you're going to have to change habits. You're going to have to change beliefs. You're going to have to change maybe the people you hang out with. There's a lot of stuff that has to change in order for you to make the radical shift to something brand new. That is very difficult to do by yourself because you are not programmed and built by evolutionary design to change easily. So having an accountability partner takes some of the stress off of you having to do it all by yourself to make those very difficult changes by yourself. 
Number six, and this is very, very important, so get yourself an accountability partner and then get yourself a ranting and complaining partner. See, I think people confuse the two. An accountability partner is not, you do not want your accountability partner to be your rant and complaining partner. Here's what I mean. A ranting and complaining partner is somebody who says, oh, you know what? You're right. That does totally suck. Oh man, you, you need to, and they play to your frustration. And sometimes you need that, right? Sometimes you just need to get it off your chest. You had a really bad day. If an accountability partner is doing that for you, you need a new accountability partner. An accountability partner should be somebody that says, hold on a second. I know that's frustrating, but what are you going to do about it? Let's solve the problem right now. What's your goals? And uh, look, there are some people, if you try to help them in the middle of a rant, they will bite your head off. So (laughs) that's why I'm saying keep these things separate. One is to support your vision. The other is to support you in the moment. Those are two different people. And let me tell you where your rant and complaining partner is not. It's not online. If you're one of those people who post on Facebook of I'm having a bad day, you do the cryptic Facebook thing where it's like, oh, life is so hard. Or, you know, and you say something and you're just trying to get people's reaction. What you are doing is reinforcing the negativity through dopamine. It's almost like a dopamine drip system when you openly complain and then people dogpile on, oh, that's so bad, that's so terrible, that's so terrible. How are you doing? Uh, Inside of our coaching program, we had um, I found a bunch of really good TED Talks on the science behind language use and language affirmation and how it actually reshapes the the um synapses 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 <laughs> it it reshapes the neural connections in our brain in other words if you constantly speak negative and people affirm or at least support that negative language, it can actually rewire your brain. So this is why you need two different people. Because yes, you need the emotional support, but you also need somebody to make sure you don't develop bad habits and that you're constantly moving forward. Number seven, you have to let your subconscious work. This is a piece of self-care that is so important. You have to let your subconscious work. What I mean by that is sometimes you just need to take a break. But take the break purposefully. So for example, identify to yourself, I need some help here. I My conscious mind isn't figuring it out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call on the power of my subconscious mind. Some people call this calling on the power of your muse. Some people say they were struck with the creative insight, et cetera, et cetera. The science is it's your subconscious mind going to work, but it's very difficult for your subconscious mind to go to work when your conscious mind is engaged in a high level. So what I like to do is say, okay, I'm taking a subconscious break. What I need is I need to solve this specific problem. And I'll literally just have this conversation in my head. I need to figure out how am I going to get more leads for the No Pants Project. Okay. How am I going to get more leads for the No Pants Project? Okay. Now I'm going to go watch a movie. And what will happen is if the movie is properly mind-turning offish, right? It's not like a difficult movie where I have to really work hard to watch. What will happen is at the end of that 90 minutes, I'll then go to a piece of paper and I'll just start writing down and see what my subconscious has come up with. And without fail, every single time, the subconscious comes up with some idea. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea, but oftentimes it's a way better idea than I was able to come up with myself when I was kind of like grinding it. I don't know what to do. 
So taking a break is very, very helpful. Letting your subconscious go to work. Number eight, set clear start and end times. The worst thing you can do for yourself is to say, I'm going to work until it's finished today. It completely ignores what's called Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law basically says any project fits to fill the constraints it's been given. So if you have one hour to write that blog post, you'll get it done. If you have forever to get that blog post done, it'll take forever. So a huge thing in self-care in not overextending yourself is having clear start and clear end times. Number seven, I recommend journaling every single day. This is just something I learned from Jim Rohn. Journaling was a big component of how I got myself off the streets. I I uh, journaled digitally at first. Literally just had like a like a the, the Hotmail accounts. You guys remember those Hotmail accounts? And then a Yahoo account or something. Just sent myself an email every day. Then when I could afford one, got a journal. I've been journaling ever since. It's been, it's been more than a decade now. Having the opportunity to take your thoughts, put them on paper. Just that act alone like I mentioned earlier with the brain dump, allows you to get clarity, take some of the pressure off your brain. But also, once it's on paper, you can think about it. This is what, this is what makes journaling so incredible. You can think about what you just wrote. You can reflect on your own thoughts. Here's something that's really wild. Keep a journal for five years, then look back to your entries three, four years ago, five years ago. And do self-analysis. What was I thinking? Why did I make that decision? Gosh, I should never do that again. I can't tell you how many times I have narrowly avoided repeating a mistake because I had made a journal entry about I should never do this again and I've accidentally stumbled upon very serendipitously that exact journal entry for maybe a year ago moments before I was going to make the similar bad choice. Journaling is very, very powerful. It also allows you to close and complete thoughts, which is to say if you have an open loop in your head or you have a concept that you can't quite nail down or if you you think something's wrong but you haven't quite identified it, Journaling will allow you to work through that process in a very efficient way so that you can have clear answers to the questions that you're asking. Number 10, I want to scream this one into the podcast and likely I will make an entire podcast about it. Please get off social media and the internet as much as you can. The internet isn't real social media isn't real go read the book trust me i'm lying go read the book um i think uh trust me i'm i'm lying was written by ryan holiday i believe go read the book irresistible by adam um adam alter that's the one that i've been reading recently where he opens the book and says hey you know all the people who make social media yeah they don't let their kids on social media cuz it's so poisonous go read di- go read digital minimalism by cal newport and etc and etc and etc social media is not real people don't post reality they post very um curated aspects of their life there is i mean i Like I said, I could do a whole entire podcast and someday that I will. The point is, social media is not a hobby worth having. Random internet lurking all day long is not a a hobby worth having. And you may want to argue me all day long about it. What I am suggesting is that your brain has not evolved to handle social media and the internet and it is making you mentally sick the more time you spend on it 
quick fact to prove the point, our attention spans are less than a goldfish. Although that particular study has been, uh, some people have put into question, it's certainly shorter than it ever has been. Now, I don't see how that is something to celebrate, (laughs) considering the premise of Cal Newport's other book, Deep Work, which is that most of what we want comes after focused, sustained, long-term effort. Seems to be the antithesis of a shorter attention span. The point is, I'm not a mental therapist, but I do know that social media and the internet causes maybe not anxiety and depression as a chronic issue, but it certainly causes acute anxiety and acute depression. If you go on to the internet and you see someone who's being more successful than you, or you see someone who started after you and is, and is doing what you, what you want to do and you've been doing it longer, or if you see somebody who's living the perfect life on Instagram, or you see someone, or you read an article that causes anxiety, the sky is falling, this is bad, da 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 and all, et cetera, and et cetera, et cetera, you are the one who put those inputs into your body. You, the one who is responsible for caring for the asset which generates the revenue in your business, decided to put poison into your body, into your mind. Now, I'm not saying don't ever get online again. I disagree with Cal Newport in that as a freelancer, it's necessarily possible to run your business without ever answering an email ever again or without ever going on Facebook ever again. What I am suggesting, though, is to stop using social media or the Internet as fill time when you aren't sure what to be doing next. You know what I'm talking about. It's that moment where you're like, I don't know, what should I do now? Let me just go check out Facebook. Uh, Let me just go read this article. Uh, Let me... That's when it becomes dangerous. If you're in a group and you're purposefully interacting and you're purposely reading through things and you're, you have a mission and a reason for why you're using the tool of social media, more power to you. If you're doing it just to do it, I think you're running the risk, and it's a pretty high risk, of endangering the most precious pieces of of your psyche, of your emotional well-being, etc. I I understand I take a fairly strong stance at, at this. I've been making my living online for 10 years and I, I there's just a lot of things I'm seeing and there's a lot of really interesting research coming out about the effects of social media. You consider how old social media is and you consider how old our brain is. And all of a sudden you realize, "Oh, maybe we weren't actually programmed to be able to handle this stuff." And oh yeah, maybe the people who design this stuff design it to keep us addicted to it and et cetera and et cetera. Okay, so um, that is our number 10. Number 11, set clear specific goals and break it down to minimum viable daily action. A lot of the pain that we cause ourselves is pain from flip-flopping all around, not knowing which way to go. Investing the time in setting brutally clear goals and breaking those goals down to what is the daily actions that you need to take can relieve a lot of pain. You can all of a sudden feel like a superhuman when you just know where you're going and what you need to do to get there. Put in the time and the effort to get clarity on that. I'm telling you, No YouTube video, no blog post is going to do the work for you. You have to sit down and make the decision, what do I want my goals to be? 
And then you have to make the second decision of how do I want to get there? There's lots of different ways to get to, especially, I mean, look, I just ranted on why social media is horrible and the internet's horrible, but as a tool, it's an incredible thing. Just like I said in the, the other uh, the podcast the other day, the internet is amazing. It's incredible as a tool. If you want to be a professional musician in 2019, guess what? You don't have to go through the record labels anymore. YouTube could make you a professional musician. So there's the two decisions. One is what do I want? And the second one is making the decision of how you want to go get it. Do you want to get it by being an internet marketing brosif and renting Lamborghinis? Or do you want to get it like we're getting it in the No Pants Project, donating 100% of our profits to various charities? There's lots of different ways to get your goals. And the internet thankfully allows you when you use it as a tool not look being on social media and using social media are two very different things i know lots of people who use social media unbelievably profitably and don't have a personal account so you have to make the decision on how you're going to uh those are the two decisions that you have to make what do you want and how you're going to get it Number 12, spend a lot of time talking to people who are not in business. One of the things that's very easy to do as a freelancer, as a business owner, is to fall into this narrow trap of only hanging out with people or being with people or talking to people or learning about or reading about business. Or being a creative and only talking to creative people, only thinking about creativity, only. There is so much in this life that the more you explore it, the less difficult it becomes to navigate. If I could have one wish, it's that everyone in the world would be allowed to visit another country for a minimum of two years. I lived in the Philippines for a couple of years in a place called Region 2. Specifically, um, I lived a little bit in a little, little town called Rojas. And then I moved up to a little town called Pina Blanca outside of Tagigarao. And then um, I, I moved some other places. Tabuk was another place that I lived that time in the Philippines has probably been more useful to me than any book I've ever read, than any course I've ever taken. There's just something about going to a completely new place, learning a completely new language, and having completely new experiences that makes life just significantly easier to navigate. Now, obviously, we can't all do that. I couldn't do it now, now that I've got kids. I mean, well, I mean, I don't want to say I couldn't do it. I probably wouldn't do it because of how much it would require to sacrifice to get out there. But you can do it on a micro scale by just talking to people that you wouldn't normally talk to. Talking to non-freelancers. Talk to non-freelancers about freelancing. When you see people's minds being blown... It can put into perspective what it is you're doing. Because if you just hang out with a bunch of freelancers and you're just starting out, you can be like, gosh, I'm not doing very good. And I don't know if I really want to do this anymore. You go talk to somebody who's stuck in a job and you talk about what it is you do. They're going to be like, oh my gosh, how did you do that? That's so incredible. Wow. That perspective is helpful. The perspective is also helpful if you go talk to an oncologist somebody who treats people who have cancer and you realize, yeah, you know what? I'm just running a freelancing business here. It's not a hospital. The emergencies that my clients think are emergencies aren't actually emergencies. Perspective is very, very helpful. It's one of the difficulties of being young is that you don't have a lot of perspective because you don't get perspective from reading you get or watching a YouTube video 
you get perspective from living and experiencing firsthand uh, different, just different situations. All right, that's number 12. Number 13, get a mentor. Get a mentor who has accomplished what you want to accomplish. Figure out how to afford it. It will save you so much time and money. If you guys want to know what's the secret to whatever I've been able to accomplish in the short time that I've been able to accomplish it, how did I go from zero to seven figures in one year with a brand new business? It's because I cheated. I had a mentor. I had someone who had already done what I want to do and I paid them money to help me to do it. Very simple. Nearly every person who has achieved something of note has had multiple mentors. I myself have multiple mentors. When I found out that Stephen King had a ton of mentors, and when I did research on who his mentors were, it was that that ultimately helped me to decide that I need to, to be better about that. Because when we think of Stephen King as an artist, as a creator, as an entrepreneur, we think of him as, you know, just it's Stephen King. He figured it out all by himself. But then when you really learn more about his backstory, you realize much of his writing was shaped by his mentors. Much of his navigating the world traditional publishing was shaped by his mentors. Like he had a lot of help to get to where he is today to the point where he has said he is a product of his mentors. Neil Gaiman is another writer I think of who has paid homage and given much credit to his mentors. I don't know if it's a social thing. I don't know if it's a cultural thing, I don't know if it's just deeply ingrained in our DNA or what it is, but there is this weird idea that if you have to have a mentor, if you have to have help, somehow you're deficient or somehow you are, you know, doing it the wrong way or you're, uh, I don't know. I don't understand the pushback against getting a mentor. To me, it's pretty easy in terms of if I want to get to a place, I need to find somebody who's been there and get as close to them as possible. And look, I know you can't always afford one-on-one mentorship. The mentor who helped me create No Pants Project cost $45,000 a year. I have another mentor. It cost me $30,000 a year. I just brought on this year. I get it. But I had mentors when I was homeless. When I had no money. And it's called a book. If you want to take care of yourself, you have got to read more. You have got to read more than you are reading right now. Even if it's just 10% more, 15% more, 20% more. Read biographies. You want to get some perspective? Go read a biography of someone you admire. Figure out what it was that they did. A couple things will happen. One, the romance will go away. It won't seem so scary, so hard, so difficult. You'll realize they made tons of mistakes along the way. You'll realize they had personality deficiencies. Oh, mercy. If I could just... One of the the best things that ever happened to me was seeing successful people up close and personal through my freelancing business, getting to work with them. Because it was so interesting to see what everybody else saw when they would go on stage and they do this thing and everyone's like, wow, they're amazing and perfect and they have no flaws. And then to be able to see that they are just regular human beings with major flaws just like me. You can still get similar experiences through books. Now, let me be clear. Books 
are a starting point. Just like I said a few minutes ago, you know, there's a huge difference between reading a book about the Philippines or watching a video about the Philippines and then living in the Philippines. Start with books and then when you can, bootstrap and invest in actually getting closer to real, actual mentors. One of the best things I ever did for my uh, fiction writing career was hiring a New York Times bestseller to talk to me every two weeks. Did the New York Times bestseller give me a bunch of advice on how to write? Not necessarily, but oh my gosh, being able to have a personal relationship with somebody who had made the New York Times bestseller list, which is a huge goal of mine in fiction, was so powerful for my mental and uh, belief system and the goals that I could set because I was like, but I know a guy who did that. He told me all his secrets. There's no reason I shouldn't be able to make some progress myself. So start with books, but work towards the real thing. Because the real thing, there's nothing like being in the room with somebody who is really successful and you coming home after that, whatever it is, and realizing I'm not that different than that person. That is a powerful moment and very important if we're talking about self-care. Because mentors can also help you when things get tough. Because they can say, you know what, I've been through exactly what you're talking about. Here's what I did to get out of it. Here's the shortcut. Also, I have empathy for you because I was there and all of a sudden things don't seem as difficult. Life will still happen, but it's much easier to navigate and it's much easier to deal with. Number 14, sleep, 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 sleep. I want to do a podcast on sleep, but I'm not nearly as smart as Matthew Walker who I believe is a, I think it's a neuroscientist. It's been a while since I read the book. He's a neuroscientist. He wrote a book called Why We Sleep. It should be required reading of everybody who wants to start a business because sleep is one of the first things we sacrifice to make the business happen. If you have a choice between sleeping or finishing a client project, and if you sleep, you have to turn it in late, I'm telling you, email your client and say, look, I'm exhausted I need to sleep. I'll turn it in tomorrow. P.S. If you make me do it now, it's not going to be that good. (laughs) Sleep is... It's incredible to me that we think it's okay to not sleep. That in some circles, it's a badge of honor to sleep less than anyone else it is so bad for you it is so bad for you and it's also completely ignoring the reality of what happens when you don't sleep when you don't sleep you don't perform very well so again if we go back to this idea of your responsibility as the freelance business owner is to care for and maintain the cash producing asset which happens to be you If you're irresponsible with your sleep patterns and you're irresponsible with your sleep care, sleep hygiene, as they call it, so that would be like looking at a screen while you're in bed or not going to sleep at the same time or drinking caffeine or alcohol before you go to bed, like all these different things. If you are not cautious about your sleep, you will not only experience an immediate diminishment in abilities. So it'll be more difficult for you to just get stuff done now. But there are long-term consequences, which are quite frightening, including, and I think this is correct. Again, I have to read the book again. If you, I think it's like if you lose an hour or two of sleep per night. 
So if you normally are a seven hour a night sleeper and then you all of a sudden for a long term uh, only sleep six hours a night or five, five or six hours a night, you double your risk of heart disease and, and various cancers and diabetes and et cetera and et cetera. That's how important sleep is. That not getting enough of it doesn't just increase your risk, it doubles your risk. Highly recommend you read the book Why We Sleep by Matt Walker. That first chapter will blow your mind. <laughs> the first chapter is basically like, here's what happens when you don't sleep. And you're like, okay, I'm going to need to read the rest of this book to figure out how to fix that. Number 15, learn how to react with play. One of the most powerful things you can do for self-care is when things get hard, play, because play is where imagination comes in and imagination is what often you need, is what you often need to solve whatever problem is before you. So if you can't get leads for your business, play. What's something super crazy and super fun you could do to get more people into your business? they just like, you know what? Screw it. It's hard anyways. Let's just have some fun and think of something Play will allow you to deal with stressful situations in non-stressful ways and come up with better ideas to get out of the problem that you're in. This is why having a freelance business is way better than a traditional income because you have more leverage to play. It's okay to play when you're the owner of the business. It's not always okay to play when you are on somebody else's dime in a traditional income you know, corporate job. It's not always encouraged. This is why I'm talking about when you have your own freelancing business, you get more flexibility to take care of yourself. Things will still be hard, but you could do something like play through the problem instead of, you know, going to the meeting and I'm a corporate robot and all that kind of stuff. Having them pigeonhole you into some, you can only get a solution if it looks like this. Number 16 Build a daily habit of positive consumption. This is called the hour of power, not something that I invented, but something I picked up from Jim Rohn, who was my very first mentor. Again, I I never had the privilege. It's one of my biggest regrets. I never had the privilege of working with Jim while he was alive. I consumed his mentorship through YouTube videos, audio programs, books. It was my start when I didn't have any money. And I could only invest a little bit here and there to buy his books, buy his audio programs. The hour of power. If we spend, let's say we spend eight hours a day sleeping. So that gives us about 16 hours a day of wakefulness. Let's say we go to a a job or we're freelancing or whatever we're doing. Let's say eight of those hours are consumed by work or thinking about work or whatever, whatever. We know that during those eight hours, there's a lot of negativity that is being put into our minds. Negativity being people don't like us, the the drama, I don't like this job, whatever that might be. So that gives us eight hours outside of work every single day. Probably three of those hours is devoted to self-care. So taking a shower, brushing your teeth, maybe working out or something. You could call that time neutral. not really positive or negative. And then we have the rest of the time where we're consuming TV and consuming YouTube and consuming whatever and whatever. Most of that consumption, 24-hour news cycle, is negative. And Jim points out, every single day, you're just filling your mind with negative stuff. Why not take a half an hour or one hour to fill it with positive stuff. Audio programs, podcasts, lessons from a program you're in, meditations, uh, whatever it is. Dedicate a specific amount of time, just one half hour block or one hour block. And the other 15 in your day The other 15 hours can still be negative. We're not asking you to change your whole life around and never know what's going on in the news. 
we're just asking you to devote. And I say we like me and Jim are like in cahoots on this. I'm just what I'm saying is it's work for me. I learned it from Jim. All I'm saying is that if you actively spend an hour a day consuming positive stuff, it will have actual benefits beyond just I feel good for a moment. It will change your beliefs and your beliefs dictate your actions. Your actions dictate your results and your consequences. Very difficult to grow a business if you believe the world is falling apart. Why would you grow a business? The world's falling apart. So spend some time in positivity. Number 17, this is our last one, is learn to categorize your problems and get the correct solution. Sometimes people think that to solve their mental health problems, they need to solve a business problem. That is not true at all. To solve a mental health problem, solve a mental health problem. If you are depressed or you are anxious or you feel like you have post-traumatic stress or you feel like you are bipolar or you feel like you're manic, a business will not solve that problem. And I am telling you this from personal experience. Starting a business, making changes to your business, Uh, solving problems within your business, that only solves business problems. If you don't like the person you, you have become, if you don't like elements of yourself, if there are pieces of, you know, you have nightmares at night or you're really socially anxious or et cetera, et cetera, whatever those issues might be, a business is not how you solve them. One of the best things you can do for yourself when it comes to self-care is to make sure you're getting the right help from the right people for the right things. Don't conflate different problems and try to solve them with what appears to be an easy solution. For example... Here's a thought I've definitely had many, many times. Something is making me anxious. I think I need to restructure my business. Maybe I need to change who I'm serving in my business because I just, I don't know, I, I have real hard time getting on the phone because I have social anxiety. Gosh, I don't know, I just feel kind of depressed. Maybe... Maybe I need to change my business. What I need is someone to help me with anxiety. What I need is someone to help me with depression. What I need is someone to help that aspect of my life. I don't, and look, I don't solve my health problems with a business. If I'm overweight and I feel gross, I know the business isn't going to help that. I know I need to go exercise and eat better. But for some reason, we think that A business is going to solve our mental health problems. I'm here to tell you our emotional problems. I'm here to tell you that's not going to happen. A therapist can help you. Meditation can help you. But you have to make sure that you are clear that they are two different things. So that you can get the care you need. So when you have a business problem, get the business problem solved by someone who is good at solving business problems. Then when you have the mental health problem, have the mental health problem solved by someone who is good at solving mental health problems. That's real self-care. It's it's about honesty and about identifying the help that you need so that you can get it. So that's the 17, my friend, in today's episodes. Hopefully it's been helpful to you. Again, the purpose of self-care, as much as it is to make us feel better, is to help us take care of the one cash-producing asset that we have in our business. This is a very practical idea. There's nothing froofy or foo-foo about it. This is about if we want to be successful as a solo entrepreneur, as a freelancer us and maybe one virtual assistant, we have to spend the time 
taking care of this very, very important asset. All right, my dear friends, that's it from me today. This was episode 10, 17 self-care tips for freelancers. You've listened to the No Pants Show. My name is Mike Shreve. If you want more information on how to grow and scale your own freelancing business, please visit us at thenopantsproject.com. We've got a really good coaching and mentoring program uh, that you can find out more about uh, after watching a case study of how I created a $26,000 a month business using many of these self-care strategies. You don't get to $26,000 a month by ignoring the number one cash producing asset in your business. You only get there after you take care of it so that it produces at that level. All right, my friends, that's it for me. Until next time, I'll see you around.